Hi. Thank you guys for your patience today. Um, as we like to say, we are way better cooks than we are with anything technical when it comes to things like computers and iPads. So we really, really appreciate your patience. Um, so we're going to cook a few dishes for you today. These are some summertime favorites, and these are all from the season cookbook. So between Justin and I, we're going to jump back and forth, and we're going to do um, some cooking. But what I'd like to get started is, so the three dishes we're going to cook today are we're going to do a flat iron steak with spigarello and tomatoes. And I don't know about you guys, but the tomatoes here in the garden and in my own backyard are really starting to get good. So this is a perfect time of year to start using the tomatoes. That dish is great because it all happens in one pan, which is awesome because then all you have to clean is one pan, which is never a bad thing. So Justin's going to show you that dish in a little bit. And then the other two dishes are a corn and fregula salad. Again, corn, it's just delicious right now. And then the third dish is, um, is a zucchini dish that I actually um, ate growing up. Justin, can you check? I think someone just asked a question. Um, I actually ate my mom. This is the version of a dish that my mom made when I was a kid. And so we just kind of jazzed it up a little bit. But it's just one of those dishes that's really simple. And if you happen to be someone that's growing zucchini in your backyard, you probably have an abundance of it. This is a great dish that's really easy to make and um, is delicious today and even great cold tomorrow. Uh, so what I want to get started on is the fregula salad. Fregula is this grain right here. Um, and what it is, is it's more like pasta than couscous. It kind of has the small, it's kind of small like couscous. It's like tiny little pasta made from semolina. And what's great about it is that it's toasty. And that's why when you see it here, it kind of looks like it's multicolored. Um, and that's because it's, it's toasted, which gives it this really delicious nutty flavor. The other cool thing is when we're finished with this dish, the, the, the um, fregula and the corn end up looking kind of similar because the corn is also this bright yellow color. So you can see even before the fregula is cooked, they're similar in color. And then when you cook it, it gets even brighter yellow. So it's kind of neat. So as you eat this dish, you're getting this, you know, this visual of like, you don't know what you're getting, corn fregula, which is kind of fun. So I've got my boiling water right here and I want to get this going. So you're going to cook this just like pasta. So... I've got my water going, salted water. I'm just gonna go ahead and add my fregula. And then um, while that's cooking, I'm gonna cut the corn. So what I have here is a bowl with another bowl inside of it flipped upside down, a smaller bowl. So I've got this large bowl and then this small bowl inside of it. This is a, a chef trick for cutting. If you're cutting, um, uh, cutting corn, because if you ever tried to cut corn off the cob, it tends to go everywhere. And this is a trick to make sure that it stays where you want it. So I've got my ears of corn, and then I'm using the, the, the butt end, the thicker end that is stable. And I'm going to go ahead and, and I'm using this small bowl inside the bowl to hold it into place. So you can see I've got the stable surface, and then I'm just going to cut it right off the cob. And see what happens? The corn falls right into the bowl instead of falling all over my cutting board. We're all about as little as you have to clean up. <laughs> And then when you're cutting corn off the cob, you also want to be sure to, you know, you want to get as much yield as possible of your kernels. But if you cut too close to the, um, to the cob, you'll get the actual bits of the cob. And that's not really pleasant to eat. So you want to be sure and just take the time to, um, to you know, to cut it where you're not cutting the actual cob. Uh, I've got my corn I'm cutting off here. This corn is delicious. It's so good you can eat it raw. And as you can see, it's just falling right here into the bowl. Let me turn my water down a little bit. I'm gonna give my regular quick stir. So part of the reason that um, I wanna have this ready to go, my corn, is that what we're gonna do is we're gonna put all this corn into the strainer in a clean sink. So what's gonna happen is when the fregula is cooked, we're gonna pour that fregula into the same strainer over the corn and what that's gonna do is just lightly cook this corn. Just enough that it still has that really kind of fresh uh, flavor, this, that nice a little bit of a texture. So it's not cooking it too much, it's just taking just that edge off, that starchiness off. And so that way again, you're not using two different um, pots to cook the corn and the fregula. You're doing it all with the same water. 
and you're also getting that natural flavor from that um, from that pasta water. So I've got my bowl. I'm going to just set this over here and I'm going to put it in my strainer so it's ready to go. Now, the next thing I want to have ready is my tomatoes. So I've got my tomatoes here. Now, I know some of you um, were at the last class, joined us for the last class, and I was able to show you my tomato trick. So I'm going to show you again in case there was someone that wasn't there. Got these beautiful cherry tomatoes. And you can use, I mean, we've got red tomatoes, yellow tomatoes, sun gold tomato, all different colors and shapes. They're just all smaller tomatoes. Um, so instead of taking each tomato and cutting it like so, which would take a chunk of time. I mean, this is a pound of tomatoes. What you're going to do is take like-sized tomatoes and put just enough under your palm. I have kind of small hands, so I can fit six tomatoes. So I'm going to be able to do this six times as fast. And you put your palm down and you raise your fingers up. Now you can, if that makes you nervous, there's another trick. Let me grab two lids. Hold on one sec. Nobody go anywhere. All right. So I've got two. These are for quart containers. You can use any size lids you want as long as they are two of the same. So I've got one lid on the bottom. Now what I can do is I can fit in maybe a few more because I'm using the lids, but you still want them to be similar size. And I'm going to flip the top lid over. So now I've got this kind of base in this bracket. So now I'm making it that nothing's going to touch my hand. A serrated knife is also the trick here. It's going to slice right through those tomatoes. Just like so. Now all my tomatoes are cut in half. All that. So I just did eight tomatoes in the same amount of time as I would have put one, do one tomato. I see someone in there doing that. I think that's a good sign, right? Yeah. Done. Right? So cool. Um, so I'm getting that ready. And then I'm going to have Justin jump in here real quick. Or not. We're going to give Justin a quick second to... So while that's happening, I've got my fregula cooking. Gonna give it one more stir here. Probably close to being ready. What I wanna do is start the zucchini. While this is cooking, I wanna start the zucchini. So beautiful squash from the garden. You want the squash to be about yay big. This is about a few inches long. You don't want them to be too tiny. You want them to be able to be stable. I've got a couple different size zucchini here. You could use yellow squash as well. And what I'm going to do is um, cut them down. So I'm just going to trim off the ends. And then I'm going to cut them in half. And if you feel like this is too big of a size, you can cut that in half even one more time. If it's super wobbly, what you can do is you can even trim a tiny little bit off the bottom to make it more stable. But that's completely up to you. If you, if you make enough of these and you have a small enough pan, you can even just squish them together so they're holding each other up. So I've got my squash here. I'm going to trim those. Right, all my beautiful zucchini. And then I've had my butter has been sitting out, getting to be room temperature because I want it to be soft and pliable at this point. So right after this, we've gotten all the squash ready. All right, that's ready to go over there. And then, so I've got my bowl here for my butter. So what I'm making here is this just really delicious lemony, garlicky herb butter. So I've got my soft butter. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in my bowl. Justin, will you take a second, just check the fregula while I'm doing this, please? And thank you. This is the nicest we've been to each other all day. Um, and then I've got my lemon zest and my preserved lemon. We're going to talk about preserved lemon in just a minute. So all here minced. All this is going in the bowl with the butter. I've got garlic and some oregano that I'm going to chop real quick here. 
So for me, with the Italian runes, I take my garlic cloves and I just take the back of my knife and I smash them just like that. So now already they're halfway chopped. I don't like to work too hard. I like to make my life easy. So, and then you can go through and give it a rough chop. I mean, if you really, really wanted to, you could even put all of these ingredients in a small food processor. If you have a tiny food processor at home, you could even throw all these things in a small food processor. The lemon, the butter, um, the lemon, yeah, both lemons, the butter, the garlic, the oregano, and then you just pulse it until it's all combined. So I've got all this going here. I wanna make sure I get the large chunks of garlic off my knife. You know what I need right now, guys? I need a wine break. Wine break. All right. Wine break. Wine break. Is that wine a break. you put in? It was oregano. What's that? Is that oregano? It's oregano. It yeah. is. Fresh oregano, garlic, and then I've got the two different types, the lemon zest and the preserved lemon and butter. Great. Thanks. We missed that. Thank Every you. Of course. All right. Everybody take a wine break. Love it. Mm. Okay. I need that. So let me just give this a quick chop. All right, so now I've got this in my bowl. I'm just gonna mix it up. Great, so now I've got this beautifully, deliciously flavored butter. I'm gonna set that aside a quick second. And then what we're gonna make is croutons. Justin, did you check this fregula? Is it about ready? Okay, so the fregula's got about two more minutes, just if you're cooking along, if you're doing it, this with me. We've got about two minutes and then so now I've got bread. I've got this nice soft bread. The crust is soft too. It doesn't, you don't have to use bread that has soft crust, but if you have a soft crust, then you don't have to bother cutting the crust off. So what I'm gonna do here is, I probably don't need quite that much. I've got my bread and I'm just gonna pull it into small pieces. I mean, you know, this is the size. What would you, I mean, this size is maybe the size of like, uh, I don't know what to relate it to. It's smaller than a cherry tomato. And so the idea here is that you want this piece of these croutons, these bread pieces, they're gonna fit on top of your squash like this. So they don't have to be uniform. It's actually better if they're not completely uniform that you want them to be, um, you know, just pull them so naturally they're gonna, they're gonna be different sizes, but you want them to be a little bit larger than a pea and a little bit smaller than a small cherry tomato. I think that might be the best. And like I said, if, you're, if the crust is soft, you can go ahead and use that soft crust. So you're just gonna go ahead and pull that naturally right in the bowl. Right. This is bread that Buttercup made and it's got herbs and cheese in it. That's never a bad thing. You could also just use plain, any, any you know, plain bread that you like would work too because again, we're adding a lot of flavor into this dish with the butter and the feta cheese and so I've got my bread, I'm gonna need a tiny bit more. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna toss this bread with a pretty generous amount of olive oil because this is gonna go on top of the, of the zucchini. So we want it to have good flavor, but then it's also going to soak up some of the flavor from that butter, All right? So I'm gonna add in a really nice amount of olive oil here. The olive oil also is gonna help it to kind of stick in place when we put it on the zucchini. Now, tell me I can give you that. Not, okay. Can you take this from me, please? Thank you. All right, so I've got my squash here on my pan. And see, I was saying, I'm just gonna leave this squash. Justin, can you strain the fregula, please? I have the squash kind of squashed together. <laughs> Did you get that joke? <laughs> um, so it's kind of holding each other up a little bit. I'm going to drizzle it with a little bit of oil. Just a tiny bit of olive oil here. I'm gonna season the squash with salt and black pepper. Because even though I'm putting all sorts of delicious flavor on it, I still want the squash itself to have flavor. So, and don't be shy with the black pepper. This is one of those dishes that really is, it's good with black pepper. I mean, anyone that has zucchini, you know it's fairly neutral, right? It's kind of tastes good with whatever you put with it. Um, so that's why we're putting all this, you know, this, this deliciousness on top of it. So we're gonna start with the butter. And I'm not gonna lie, this can be a little messy. So I'm gonna grab a pair of gloves or another way you can do it at home is you can take like a spoon and dot it. But because I have gloves, I'm gonna throw a pair on. 
And then that's going to make it easier here. Um, Justin is straining the fregula pasta. So like I said, he's straining it into a colander and that colander is holding the corn that we cut off the cob. So as he strains it, he's going to pour it directly over top. So it gently cooks that corn a little bit. Oh, he's going to come show you. Great. Can you flip that back so I can see? Of All right. So while Justin's grabbing that, I'm going to show you all, right? So I've got this beautiful butter and I'm just putting dots of the butter on the squash. And you want to just put enough dots. I'm kind of putting like three big dots on each piece of squash. And then as it cooks, it'll melt. So while I'm doing that, Justin's going to show you. So the corn is in this strainer right here. Tracy, could you please tell us about the lemon preserved, um, how you put it with peppers, or did you use cinnamon, or what did you do? Yeah, thank you for, for reminding me that that's something I want to talk about. So preserved lemon is something we use a lot of in this kitchen, and it's, I, I kind of think of it as a, a, one of those tricks that chefs have up their sleeve for something that's pretty simple but can add a lot of flavor to a dish. So uh, like, like most vegetables or anything in, the, in its season, lemons, um, when it's lemon season uh, in wintertime, like January, we get a lot of them. And there's only so much you can do with lemons. And so we often preserve most of our lemons and we like Meyer lemons, um, but regular lemons would work too. Meyer lemons are just a tiny bit sweeter. They're a little bit less bitter. And so, um, so we've got Meyer lemons and what you do is you pack them in salt. And um, you cut them in quarters, so, um, so you can get really chewed like the inside part of it. And then you toss it in salt and really make sure everything is coated. Every part of it is coated in salt. We have a, a food saver, like a cryovac machine, so we put them right into that. But at home when I make it, I just pack them into a big jar. I actually pack them into a clear jar. So I toss them in salt and then stuff the lemons into a jar and then pour more salt over the top. And what happens is over the course of time, those I actually leave on my counter because they're pretty. And the longer they, if they're sitting out at room temperature, they preserve a little bit faster. Here at Wake Work, we tend to keep them in the refrigerator because we make so many of them. But what happens is over the course of time, see this is one of our big bags of preserved lemons. Over the course of time, what happens is that salt, and some people even add a dash of sugar. We don't add sugar to ours. It's just straight salt. But you can see it looks like there's liquid in here. We didn't add any liquid. That's what happens from it sitting in the salt. At least it leaches that moisture out and it preserves the lemon. So it takes away that bitter. And what you end up using is, hold on, I have a preserved lemon. right inside. I have one pulled right inside the walk-in in a bowl. Um, what ends up happening is, is that it pulls the bitterness out. And really the part that you use is the skin. It's you're no longer so traditionally, right? If you're using a raw lemon, you would probably use stuff from the inside, the meat of the lemon, the fruit of the lemon. Once you preserve the lemon, what you end up doing is actually pulling that meat out. So here's what it ends up looking like, right? You have this, this lemon that's cut in quarters and, and like, so, right? So you've got this outside rind. What we do then is pull out the center. So all that fruit is not what you use. We have used this, like sometimes you can puree this into a salad dressing or a sauce, but this gets really salty because it's been sitting in salt. But what happens with the rind is that it gets it's this really, it's this beautiful chewy texture, but also just this wonderful salty, citrusy, really just unique flavor. There's nothing else like it. So that's what we use. We'll chop this up and put it in dressings. We have it like this. You can put it in butter. You can add it to salads. It's, it's probably an ingredient that I use most in my own home when I want to make something taste good with very, little, with very little to do to it. And it's something you can have year-round because during the season, if you preserve enough lemons, then you just have it year-round as, as your secret ingredient. So going back to the squash real quick. Um, I've got my butter, and then I'm going to go ahead and put my crumbled feta cheese on top. Same thing, I'm just using like the, the butter is gonna help everything else to adhere to the top of the squash. And for those of you that have taken my classes or have come to any of the events at KJ, you know that I am the big cheese around here. Cheese is my gig, so don't be shy with the cheese. 
The other thing that happens when you do this, just naturally some tend to fall onto your sheet tray. I mean, you don't want too much to fall on there because you want that flavor of it on your um, squash. But I'm not going to lie. What ends up happening is like the same thing that happens with, say, like a lasagna. The pieces that fall get like a little bit crispier and a little bit darker. It's like the edge of a mac and cheese or a lasagna. And they get like this extra special brown. And they're kind of the, the treats um, once you... Uh, once everything's cooked, they're like the pieces that everybody fights over when they, uh, when they go to get them from the tray. So now I've got my feta cheese on here. Now is when I'm going to go ahead and add my bread. So I've got this bread that at this point feels like wet from the olive oil, which is good. That's all flavor. So now you're just going to, you know, at this point, you're going to have to kind of purposely put that, place that bread down. But again, the, the butter is going to help to hold it. And I'm just going to, Put all those pieces on here. Same thing that you, some of this bread will fall off. We like to call it the kickstand. That if some of the bread falls off, it often will just help keep that squash in place. It'll hold it out like a kickstand would a bike. But see how I'm able to do this when the squash is all kind of tight together? I don't have to be quite as finicky about how I put it on the squash. I can just kind of put it, you know, toss it on there a little bit quicker because it's all holding each other up. So now that I've got this ready to go in the oven, I'm going to let Justin kind of jump in here and he's going to walk you guys through the, um, the steak dish. And then while the steak is resting, um, I'll come back and finish up the regular salad with you. So nobody go anywhere, but this is a great time to have a sip of wine. I'm going to grab that in the, uh, in the oven. Justin, we can't hear you. Justin, they can't hear you. Can y'all hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you clear. Good. Okay, cool. So um, I'm pouring myself a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. It's our Kelsey Hills uh, from Lake County. And this is a new wine for us. This is the first year we've had this wine. Uh, this is a 2019 Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's got really nice, crisp acid, uh, some minerality to it. Great wine. We're actually been working on a dish. We're going to put it on the wine and food menu. Um, we have uh, a, a hamachi dish with cucumbers from the garden we've been working on. So let's see. Back to this. Um, we have uh, our corn, and I basically just pulled the hot pasta, poured the hot pasta liquid and pasta over the corn, and that just kind of took the raw starchiness off of it, um, and it's just barely, barely cooked. You know, sweet corn at the peak is uh, definitely the best. This corn is from Brentwood, California. Um, they grow some of the best, sweetest corn around, and... It's, uh, it's just really nice. It's nice that it's a similar texture to the pasta. It's a great dish to eat room temperature because you could uh, just make it and you know, take it to a party or a picnic. It's a really simple dish. Um, and we're just going to finish that with some tomatoes and parsley in a minute. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to clean up the steak. This is our flat iron steak. And this is from a company called Snake River Farms. And we, uh, we use a lot of their meat. They're really consistent, really great quality. And the nice thing about the flat iron is there's not a whole lot of waste on it. Um, and it's a really good, simple, quick cooking uh, steak. Let me, uh, one sec. So I'm just going to open the bag up here. And when you, sometimes when you buy it, it'll come pan ready like this. Other times it'll have a layer of sinew and it's basically two pieces of meat uh, running together. Um, but you can see this has some really nice marbling in it. So we're just going to go through and just pull out some of the, uh, the veins here. 
and then some of the sinew from the other side. And over here, you can see in the other camera, I have a cast iron pan, just preheating. And uh, the cast iron pan is kind of my go-to pan at the house because I am the head dishwasher at the house. Chef. So I try and use one pan, especially in the summertime. Um, we have a pretty small house. We don't have air conditioning. And when it's hot, uh, I do a lot of cooking outside. So I'll take that one pan and I will pop it on my grill, a little side burner, and I'll go ahead and cook this outside. Hey, Tommy, will you hit mute on there for uh, Tracy? So you can just see, I just took just a little bit of that sinew out of there. And um, then that's pretty much it. There's really not much you have to do to it. So if you find it at the grocery store and it's ready like this, there's not a whole lot of waste. Um, and then this company, Snake River Farms, they will ship this direct. So we're just gonna season that up with a little salt and pepper and then pop it in the cast iron pan that's been pre-eaten over here. We're gonna use a little bit of rice oil. Um, that's our main cooking oil. It's got a high smoking point and it's relatively inexpensive and very neutral in flavor. Um, but you could use uh, uh, peanut oil or olive oil or corn oil, whatever kind of oil you cook in at your house is going to be fine for this. Rice oil is just kind of the one we go to for the high temp and neutral flavor. So I'm going to hit it up with a little bit of salt. And then some black pepper. And I go back and forth. Uh, we don't use a ton of black pepper um, when we're cooking at work for wine pairing, but there's certain things that I do like it on. Uh, definitely steaks and tomatoes. So some fresh ground pepper on there. I can uh, see that pan's getting nice and hot. Hopefully you can see that there. And then this is kind of fun. If you um, if you ever have the opportunity, these are pretty cool. These are called the Chef's Press. So this is a stainless steel 13-ounce weight. And uh, once I pop that in the pan, I'm going to throw the weight on top, and that's going to help hold it down. Because anytime you're cooking a piece of meat, you put something cold into a hot pan, it's going to tend to kind of curl up. So if you have a weight where you hold it down with a spatula when you first put it in, you're going to get that nice even sear on it. Anytime you're putting the food in, you want to do it away from yourself so if it does blast oil, it's going in the other direction. So I'm just going to pop that weight on, push it down, and that's going to hold it down to get that nice sear on it. So we'll leave it on there for a minute or two. Um, and then once that cooks, we're going to flip it over. And then when it's resting, we're going to go ahead and cook some Figarello in that pan with a little bit of garlic and olive oil. Um, Figarello is something we grow in the garden here. Uh, it is uh, basically a, a broccoli that doesn't form the head and flower. So it, it tastes very similar to kale, but less bitter and has more of a sweet flavor. Um, so we, I don't know if we can see it over here. Let me see if you can see it in that one. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, it grows kind of like kale, but it's a little bit thinner, a little more tender, and less bitter. So it's going to be the new kale. People in Iowa are going to be wearing Spigarello shirts in like two years from now. Um, so quick saute on it. It kind of gets uh, a little bit, if you go in a really, really hot pan, it almost starts to get crispy. And then you just kind of want to keep it moving and just welt it a little bit. And we're also going to sear some cherry tomatoes. This, uh, this week is the first week that we've been pulling some beautiful tomatoes out of the garden. We had a nice little heat wave the week before, which for us was really hot. We were in the you know, high 90s a couple of days. And that just kind of made everything in the garden uh, really start popping out. So cherry tomatoes um, started getting ripe. And this time of year, we use them in all kinds of stuff. 
Uh, a lot of times when we're cooking them with red, when we're using them with red wine, we'll do something to them. We'll cook them a lot. Of, we usually don't serve the raw tomatoes too much with red wine unless it's more of a garnish. So today we're going to sear it in that nice steak fat. So you can see the fat's starting to render out a little bit. We'll give that another minute or so. I can give it one more crust down there. Give it a little sear. But these are great. Definitely for fish. Uh, they have a couple different sizes. And with a bigger piece of meat, you can even stack them, um, which is really fun. So the, the company is California Kitchen, the Chef Press. Um, we love them. We have them in the kitchen. They tend to disappear, though. I think we only have a couple left. Um, that's how you know the cooks like it, if your, uh, your little equipment starts disappearing. So I think we got two left. I'm going to take a little sip of uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Does anybody have any questions about anything we've seen or done so far? Um, I, I, I know Tracy was talking about the preserved Meyer lemon, and that is one of my favorite things. Um, we're fortunate in Sonoma County that lots of citrus grows here, and uh, we have a lot more than we can use, so that's when we preserve it. And, and to me, um, check this. Um, to me, it's almost more of a seasoning method when you use the preserve, preserve lemon. And it's nice because you can add citrus flavor to dishes without adding acid. So you get that nice lemon flavor without adding a lot of acid to your dish. So I'm gonna give it a little more salt to this side and then I'm gonna go ahead and give it a flip. Those are probably a little bit darker. I probably needed like one minute less on there. I'm gonna go ahead and pop that back on and let it cook a little bit longer. And then while that steak finishes cooking and rest, Tracy's going to go ahead and uh, finish our salad for us. Um, let's see here. Another thing that's pretty cool is we're doing, for the local folks right now, I don't know if eventually we'll ship it, but we're doing this really cool farm box uh, um, where I'll see if I can find one and I can show you what's in it. But like this week it has, does it have cherry tomatoes in it? You know, I think. I know it's bigarello. It's got the squash. It's got beautiful green beans, and it's awesome because uh, the local folks can come pick this up at the winery. It's got tips from uh, Tucker and uh, a recipe from us as well. So this is one fun ingredient that Tracy is going to add to the salad. This is called purslane. And uh, so I've been here, this is my 17th year. And when I first got here, I'll, uh, I, uh, I asked the gardener to plant purslane because I really liked it. It's great for salads, a great garnish. And that was probably one of the bigger mistakes I've made of being the chef here because it takes over everything. So it's basically a weed. You probably might, a lot of you might even have this in your backyard right now. Um, and you might hate it, but it tastes delicious. So it's used in France a lot, raw and salad or cooked down. In Mexico, there's a really popular dish that they make with it where they'll just give it a quick welt with some tomatoes and cook eggs with it and eat it on a taco. Um, you can blend it into soup. It has kind of that oxalis, kind of, kind of almost like a, a lemon and a green apple, kind of like that acid to it. Um, and a green flavor, but it's really great. Uh, you can finish it with a pasta. Um, but if you plant it in your garden, be careful because it'll end up everywhere. The birds take the seeds and move around the garden and it'll take things over. Um, so I'm just going to turn that steak off. It's got a nice here on this side too. I'm just going to let it kind of rest over there in the pan. Um, but personally, it's a fun one to, to sort out. You can, uh, you can find it at the farmer's market for sure. And uh, lots of different uses, super healthy. So I'm gonna let Tracy hop back in here for a sec. And if you have any questions, just send us a little text and we will try and answer them. Okay. Me again. I want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay. Um, oh, good, Tracy. 
Thank you, Jessica. All right, so let's get back to this salad. So we've got our corn and our fagula here. And like I was saying, when we first started cooking this, you're not gonna be able to really tell the difference between the color of the two, which is kind of fun. Um, I've got those beautiful cherry tomatoes that I cut in half. I've also got some minced chives in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and add that directly into the bowl. And then I've got um, some olive oil and some rice wine vinegar. The reason I like rice wine vinegar in this dish is that uh, it's just a little bit sweeter. It's not quite as acidic. The tomatoes obviously have a lot of natural acidity and I don't wanna take away from that. I wanna be able to taste the tomato. Rice wine vinegar is a little bit more of a softer vinegar, uh, a little bit of sweetness to it, which is gonna be right in line with the sweetness of the tomato, the sweetness of the corn. So I've got the rice wine vinegar, and then I'm just gonna season this with some salt and pepper. And then what I like to do with the purslane, so like Justin was saying, purslane is a weed. It tends to grow like in the cracks of the sidewalk. So, um, you know, where the, where the T or the cross of the sidewalk is, you'll see purslane and it grows, it kind of crawls out. Um, and it's the thing you're kind of constantly picking at. It's got this really great um, acidic flavor to it and really just awesome texture because it's a succulent. So it's got a nice crunch to it. So that's part of the reason I love it in this dish is that we really got a couple really, we've got some great textures going on here. We've got the pasta, which is the texture kind of soft. And then the corn, which is not, you know, we took a little bit of the, uh, cooked it a little bit. So thank you. Um, so it's just a tiny bit crunchy, this tomato texture and now this purslane. So what I like to do is add in some of the purslane and I just leave a little bit um, off to the side. So after I put it in the bowl, I've got this beautiful garnish. I'm gonna go ahead and toss everything. So right now we've got these beautiful colors happening here and then you can solder it. Wait, right, so I've got this full and then right at the end, some more of those fresh purslane leaves right on top. One part of dinner's done. And really, I mean, I know that People always think it's funny when a chef says, it's that easy, because I know for us, we do it every day that it's easy, but these dishes today, they really are that easy. Um, some of the time we wanna make it as simple as possible. Like Justin was saying, we don't wanna be inside cooking where it's hot as much. We wanna be outside. We you know, wanna be able to be enjoying this beautiful weather. And so the least amount that you have to cook and the fresher the ingredients, I mean, this is the time of year where the season really lends itself to ingredients that don't need a lot of cooking. So Justin, um, do you want to talk about this or can I get the squashes ready so I can show them? Okay, so let me just grab a towel here. So the squash is ready. So really that short amount of time that Justin was cooking the steak and I mixed that salad, the squash is ready to go. So you've got this pan. I mean, see how gorgeous this is? I mean, that bread got brown and crispy and so I'm just gonna prep that. And then at this point, that's it, it's done. So the trick here too is in the cookbook or in the recipe, it does give a time, but really that time that you're cooking it is gonna depend on the size of your zucchini. So keep that in mind because you don't want this to be a dish where the zucchini is mushy. You want it to still have enough structure that when you bite into it, it holds up. But this is really good. If you make this and you're lucky enough to have just a few pieces left over, this is one of those snacks that's really delicious the next day with a fried egg or even just on its own right out of the fridge. All right. And I know a lot of you are drinking, we're drinking the Sauvignon Blanc tonight. This is delicious with the Sauvignon Blanc because of that feta cheese. It's got that nice, you know, it's briny and salty and then the lemon with the acid. So this is really delicious with the Sauvignon Blanc. Thank you very much. Right. And like I said, all that leftover wonderful that's on the pan, if you want to be generous and put it on the plate, you can, or you can just save it for yourself as the person that cooked the dish and those are your nibbles in the kitchen. So there we go. All right, Justin, I'm going to take my wine and walk back here. <laughs> Justin, do you want to unmute, please? You need to unmute.
There we go. Can you all hear me now? We can. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So now we're just going to um, cook off our spigarello. And all we did, I, I forgot to save some on the stem, but basically just like you would collard greens or anything, but the stick, stick stem, just go ahead and pull that off. Um, if you wanted it to be smaller, you could give it a, a rough chop and make it a little bit smaller, but we're just going to go ahead and cook it. So I'm going to pour some of this fat off from the steak and then give that pan a little wipe. And I'm gonna add some uh, olive oil. Get it nice and hot. The nice thing about cast iron is no matter what you're cooking on, you can usually get it pretty hot. You just have to leave it on longer. So you can see, um, I don't know if you can see that, but the oil moving pretty quickly around there. So it's definitely hot. So we're just gonna pop this spigarello in there. And you can hear it popping and that, that'll get really crispy if you want to cook it crispy. But we just kind of want it to wilt. So it's literally like that fast. And you kind of just cook it, scoot it over, and then you add some more spear pan. So this started off as uh, maybe a pound of spigarello. And then we cleaned it and it's probably about 10 ounces that I'm putting into the pan. So I'm just kind of flipping it around, Let's put the heat back on, coating it with the oil. We get a little bit of kosher salt. So we use um, kosher salt most of the time for cooking and most of our recipes are based on that. And then we use a lot of finishing salts. Like after we slice the meat, we'll uh, finish it with a nice crunchy salt. And I think that's a, a good tip for home cooks is to have different kinds of salts for different things. And, play around with it. Um, so you can see it's starting to weld. It's got a beautiful glossy color there. And then I'm gonna add a little bit more. We'll just finish that off. Just give it a couple turns. And we're gonna add a little bit of garlic and oil to the pan as well. And then we're gonna sear off some tomatoes. And you could make a sauce for this steak. You could do, uh, you know, fresh salsa verde with you ha if you have herbs from your garden. Um, you know, if you had a nice stock in the freezer, you could finish it with some sauce like that. But this type of year, time of year, we're not using a lot of rich sauces. We use a lot of fresh sauces. You know, even just a little sour cream. Trick about it. Trick about it. Um, so we. Uh, you know, even just a little bit of horseradish and sour cream could be a nice way to finish this dish. So it's nice and well through there. So I'm gonna scoot it over to that side of the pan. I'm gonna add just a touch more oil. I might have done this in the wrong order. I haven't made this dish since, uh, probably since last summer. Um, so we're gonna add that garlic in there, get a little of the aroma and flavor coming out of there. And once that starts to brown and you can really smell it, we're just going to add our cherry tomatoes. So we got a couple different colors in here. And we're just going to sear them till they pop, till they pop and some of the juice comes out. And then just warm them up. We don't want to cook them too much because they'll turn to mush, but we want them to pop. So it kind of helps the skin break down a little bit and um, just warms them through. Add a little bit of salt on top of there. Let me hold this up to the camera so you can see the skin are already starting to get some color, starting to pop, but not, we don't want to overcook them. And our pan's still hot, so we definitely want to flip our spigarello a little bit. And I can see they're starting to pop open. You can even almost sear them. So that's it. Um, that's simple. I'm going to turn the pan off. Just let it sit in there for a minute. And then got my steak over here. And that's been resting, I don't know, about five minutes. This one's going to be 
about medium rare to medium, probably. Hey, can you hand me a little cutting board, please? Oh, never mind. Thanks, Paul. So we got a little cutting board here. Let's go ahead and uh, and then I have the the juices from the resting meat there. I'm just gonna go ahead and pour that into the pan. Let it steam for a second. So you can see those tomatoes are getting some nice color on them. It smells amazing. You can really smell the garlic. So we'll go ahead and uh, pop this on the plate here. A little toss around there. This is a nice, you know, I mean, reasonably healthy dish. You know, there's not a whole lot of fat in it. Uh, there's a lot of big flavors here. A little bit of protein from the steak there. Then let me see if I can move this over and we'll slice this beef. So anytime you're slicing meat, you want to slice against the grain. So in here, I can see that the grain's running this direction. I'm going to cut it just a little bit of an angle. You can see it's probably medium rare, close to medium. Um, it's not, for me, if you cook this steak super rare, it can be a little chewy. So this is kind of how I would like to cook it here. You probably could have rested another couple minutes, but it looks pretty nice. Got some great marbling in the steak. So we're just gonna slice it and pop it on here. We'll finish it with some nice Malden salt and a little bit of uh, fresh olive oil. If you if you like horseradish on your steak, you could definitely go that route right now. A little fresh olive oil, give it a little. Oh shoot, sorry. Pop that over there once. So we'll finish it with just a touch of olive oil and a little bit of nice salt trace. You want to pour us a glass of the Syrah. So we got our Alisos Hills Syrah here. Um, I love that wine and I like to have it a little bit chilled this time of year when it's hot outside. Just put a little chill on it. Um, but it's got nice fruit. It's got some tannins to hold up to the, the richness of this steak. Let's see if I can pop that in there so you can see it. And it's from down south, uh, and near Santa Barbara area down there. Beautiful area. A lot of our produce is grown down there, and it's an amazing area for growing wine. Great climate, really hot in the daytime and then a uh, nice cool night. But it's all about the soil down there. The soil is ridiculous and there's all these little microclimates kind of like here. It's a great region for growing grapes and berries. A lot of the berries you eat at home are coming from that area. Um, so yeah, we got the uh, corn and tomato salad there. One of my favorite summer dishes is this beautiful zucchini or squash dish with the, you see over there too, um, with the breadcrumbs. So this is kind of, you know, I'd be stoked if I came over to somebody's house and they were serving this for dinner.